Hello everyone. Welcome to another edition of the ESQ Practical Lawyers Academy webinar series. We are glad you could join us today. My name is Tosu Shilanke. I am the Administrator and Head of Training at ESQ Trainings Limited. At ESQ Trainings Limited, our mission is to expand the frontiers of continuous professional learning. We are committed to the development of a robust and easily accessible of practical information and continuous legal education and professional development for lawyers and for other professionals. This we achieve by providing the highest quality accredited professional education in a variety of formats for lawyers, for accountants, for tax experts, for oil and gas experts, and other professionals. So we offer courses and trainings across various areas of practice, and we have categorized these areas of practice into academies. So we have the litigation and the other dispute resolution academy, we have the intellectual property academy, we have the tax academy, we have the construction and capital projects academy, we have the fintech academy, and um, many other academies like that. So we have tagged this webinar series, the launch our webinar series, as they are fitted to hold at 1 p.m. during lunch breaks. So they usually hold three days of the week, that's Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So, however, because of our Muslim participants, in order to accommodate their prayer time, we usually meet at 11 a.m. on Fridays. So our Friday webinars are 11 a.m. And after every session, we provide the resources that, we, that are shared. We provide them in easily accessible formats for everyone who is interested. And at the moment, we are taking registrations for our training on power. We have the training on power, which registration is ongoing at the moment. It's a 12 virtual distance learning course and it's titled the dynamics of power contracts, regulation, contract negotiation, documentation, and project financing. It commences on the 16th of February, 2021. So if you need to get more information about this training, please send me an email at o.chulanke law at esq-law.com, o.chulanke at esq-law.com. So the focus of today's webinar is explaining cyber risk to senior executives. So the work of uh, the work of cyber security experts in a company is not only to secure the company's data, it is also to enlighten the members of the company. And in addition to enlightening the staff, much work is tied to getting the senior executives to spend money on the cyber security infrastructure. So many a time we find that communicating cyber risk and the necessity of cyber infrastructure can be a bit complicated. So today we'll be learning how network specialists you know, can easily communicate with their senior executives. And our panelists will also be shedding light on identifying the easy ways of communicating the common cyber risk to non-tech people. We'll be outlining the legal business and institutional necessity for cyber infrastructure. We'll also be outlining the important internal policies companies must have on cyber security and they'll be identifying the ways of communicating data breach to senior executives. So we are privileged this morning to connect with our panelists who are experts in cyber tech. Um, I think she went off. I questions while the webinar is going on. I'm delighted to introduce the Chief Ladik. He is the Vice President of IHS Towers and also the CEO of CIG, no, GIC, which is a subsidiary of IHS. So, Mr. Ladiko, over to you now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? I need to confirm. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, yes, I can hear you. Yeah, thank you. I, I think you've done uh, a wonderful introduction of the um, topic to discuss. I'm uh, happy to be here and I think that the discussants are also uh, quite prepared uh, to onboard and provide insights into what it takes to effectively communicate uh, cybersecurity, uh, the process, the concept. Uh, the associated risk and how to manage it within an organization uh, to participants on the webinar. Uh, I believe that you've provided some um, fundamental uh, uh, background to what cybersecurity is, but I may just want to mention that this is all uh, related to ensuring that the systems 
uh, uh, networks are protected from uh, infractions by people who threaten it um, in order to gain access to it. And getting access to those systems, not necessarily just uh, for the purpose of accessing, but to make changes or to tamper with those systems and networks uh, in such a way as to derive certain benefit that may be uh, inimical to the operations of those systems and networks or their performance in general. I think uh, for lawyers, since this is more of a corporate uh, discourse, the key issues around cybersecurity uh, revolves around what, what you need to do to ensure that the, the your systems, your network, the processes that it drives and the operations that it drives are secure uh, and are operating within the ambit of the requisite uh, regulations and law that guides that business and guides its interactions with its customers. Um, but I mean, at the heart of cybersecurity, uh, you know, the people um, that manages uh, those systems, uh, the people who need to know, the people who need to take action, uh, and the processes that they take to ensure that uh, those uh, actions or the required tests and resilience are built into those systems and network. And of course, uh, the technologies that are involved in ensuring that all of the processes are activated and work seamlessly to deliver the right level of protection for the business for continuity's sake uh, and to uh, avail uh, it the right protection against the requisite risk. So, um, I have a fellow discussant on this uh, webinar, this session. Uh, I would ask that they introduce themselves uh, to you. I think one of our discussants is uh, unavoidably absent this morning, but I am sure that the other two that are on the uh, program would do justice to the uh, discussion. And then afterwards, we can all ask uh, questions after they've done their presentation. I would leave uh, Mrs. Adewumi and uh, Mr. Shaolu to uh, introduce themselves, uh, after which we can proceed to the presentations and start talking through what cybersecurity is and who needs to know within an organization, what processes we need to have for disclosure, who needs to coordinate the disclosure, uh, and how do we ensure that the right uh, processes are in place and the right governance are in place to ensure that the company works within, again, defined regulatory rules and uh, corporate uh, governance provisions uh, within the organization and outside of it. So, again, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the session. Uh, Mrs. Adewumi, please, you may introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, moderator. Yeah, good afternoon again. And um, thank you very much, uh, ESQ, for having me here today. Um, a quick introduction. My name is Ayodeji Adewumi, as you said. And um, presently, I'm the Data Protection Officer for Zenith Bank UK, and I'm also a certified privacy practitioner with a legal background. And um, I have a passion for data protection. I have a passion for cybersecurity, anything that has to do with workings of organizations on the using technology is my interest. And largely, I have a very strong interest. And because I believe the world we live in today needs it, a protection of individuals while we work systems for providing services and um, products to people across the world. Yeah, so that's, that's the, uh, my brief introduction I'll provide to you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Adeomi. Mr. Shalu, over to you. Introduction. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am the managing partner at Zelma Consulting. And then the project producer, the Zelma Act. The Zelma Act is the Zelma Action to Reduce Cyber Crimes, where we um, rehabilitate essential cyber criminals, empower them, and convert them from cyber criminals to cyber cops. So they help in eliminating a prospective cyber crimes. Um, my interest beyond you know, eliminating cyber crimes, I also have an um, interest in 
helping organizations to identify and prevent cyber threats. So, because we believe prevention is better than cure. So, what we try to do is to look at the threats, the trends, and then to warn beforehand. And we have um, a large network of um, cyber operatives, both on both sides of, of the divide, you know, to, to provide the information and the guidance as well. Uh, I believe that will benefit a lot from the webinar today, and I really look forward to it. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, excellent. Uh, thank you. So, uh, and, and just for the participants, uh, please, the uh, presenters would uh, uh, do a 15 minutes maximum uh, presentation, just talk through uh, their views on the issues that we're discussing. Uh, and after that, we can ask questions. Please uh, be free to, you may write down your questions. I think it's probably a, a order here where you can also send in questions uh, and the discussants would uh, address those questions afterwards. Um, and at least no question is too mundane. Let's make it as interactive as, as possible. I think we should uh, sort of share ideas and this forum is supposed to enable us to do that uh, with the guidance of the panelists who are subject matter experts on uh, the issues being discussed. Okay, uh, so this is uh, Adobe. You may want to go ahead and uh, present. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know, can I get my slide on the screen, please? Yeah, thank you. Okay, I would like to make a start by saying briefly and quickly that um, the it's it, we are living in times when we cannot overemphasize the need for cyber security, considering the fact that um, almost hundred percent of what we do right now is done virtually. Everything we do we do is is done via systems, and um, everything is done in the in, uh, cyberspace. Organizations are trending now, and everything they are doing is done virtually automated processes everywhere. Now, while we do this, cybersecurity becomes threatened because we have different people who are trying to access information for different purposes. And therefore it becomes very vital for us to have a good understanding of what cybersecurity is, understand the risk we're exposed to as an organization, the risk we're exposed to as individuals, and what steps we can take actually to ensure that we cop this. And I'll quickly say also that um, what we are trying to achieve here today is ensuring that organizations understand in the simplest way they can the importance of cybersecurity and the risk posed that, that the working or uh, their technology and the use of system poses to their daily business. And importantly, for senior executives to understand this particular uh, uh, threat and agree with um, the operatives within the organization on what should be done about it. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, I've said here that we all know cybersecurity basically is any potential risk or harm that an organization can suffer as a result of using technology. So it's as simple as this. Can we suffer any harm or loss as a result of the fact that we are using technology in the place of our business? Although I also know that the focus of this particular discourse today is not on the individuals whose information will probably will process while we are working, but basically so, solely on the organization and ensuring that the executives and those on the, uh, responsible for the business of the, uh, of the organization do the right thing. And in discussing cyber risk, there are three key points that we'd always need to understand and have a good disability of, and that's the people, our process, and our technology. When we say people, who are we referring to here? We're referring to anyone who can have access to our technology within the, the, the organization. And the, uh, the people we are referring to here are both the employees, the threat vectors and the hackers out there who are trying to get access into the, the, the technology of the system, and also those who have authorized access to work it. Because if you have employees within organizations who don't know how to work the system and who don't have a good understanding of the risk working on technology poses to them, to them as individuals, and to the business becomes a problem. Then we also need to consider, do we have proper processes within the organization that employees need to know to ensure that they have visibility of and they have good understanding of when they are processing and doing anything using technology within the organization? And thirdly, what technology do you have in place? Do you have a good understanding 
of the technology you're using within your business? Also, is that particular technology fit for what you do as an organization? Is it fit for the processes that you carry out? Because we would all know international best practice says that any organization to ensure that at every point in time to continuously fight cyber risk and ensure that you are cyber secure, the level of technology involved in the business must be suitable to the level of activities carried out within that business. So it's important we understand the people, the process and the technology in place in any organization. Next slide, please. Now, we come to the question. If we say that cyber risk is important, we should understand the cyber risk we face as a business to be able to secure the business and ensure that we do things properly. The only way we can do this is to have a clear visibility of our cyber infrastructure. This is the problem most organizations across the world face. We are all working with technology now when it's in a, uh, at an age where information is everywhere. There's access to information. We should ensure that we have a good visibility of our infrastructure that we use to access, uh, to process information and also that we use within our business. And you ask yourself the question, when we talk about cyber inf infrastructure, what are we talking about? We are talking about the entire landscape of technology engaged within a business. And you think, is this important? All I need to do is have a system where I can be able to work one or two things and that's done. But it's important for us to understand the cyber infrastructure within the business. And there's a legal reason for it. There's a business reason for it. And there's an institutional uh, reason for this. I'll run through, I have uh, three, uh, six key points you will see before you with respect to the necessity for cyber infrastructure and understanding the cyber, the cyber infrastructure within the business. The first is the business objectives. You need to think about it now. What is the objective of my business? What is the objective of this organization? In which way would technology help us to achieve these business objectives? We live in an age and an era where it's impossible for most organizations to fulfill their objectives without having the proper technology in place and understanding what this technology is so they are able to remain competitive and also in business. Obviously, we also know that there's an economic advantage to being uh, a technology survey organization. When you are technology survey, you are able to process your activities and do things quicker and safer. And therefore you have an economic advantage. Your bottom line is secured, your profit and loss, your profit um, ratio obviously is also in a good place. Understanding and having a good cyber infrastructure system in place would help business continuity. It would definitely help business continuity. Organizations who don't have proper systems in place and proper understanding of their cyber infrastructure could have their business go under in one day and that's the end of everything. There are several, several cyber threats out there that can discontinue any, bus any business without formal actions being taken against them in any way. And therefore the cyber infrastructure and the cyber space of any organization should be visible to those who are responsible for this and also have a good understanding so they are able to propagate and sell this message to senior executives within the business. There's obviously growing legal and regulatory compliance issues involved in cyber security and the, uh, the cyber infrastructure of any organization. First, we, we now know that um, there are cyber uh, security uh, protection laws across the world. There's importantly the use of data, which uh, 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 both local and international laws are providing regulation. A quick one would be what we had a few years ago in the international scene when the GDPR came on board. And basically, this is the regulation that affects organizations everywhere in the world. In Nigeria, we have the Nigerian Data Protection Regulation and also the Data Protection Bill, which is still um, be before the house, not yet passed into law. What all these regulations seeks to do is to ensure that organizations know what their cyberspace looks like. For you to protect data that you come in contact with, for you to protect data that you process, you must have a good understanding of a cyber, uh, your cyber uh, space and the infrastructure you have in place. And most of this regulation ensures and provides strictly that organizations must ensure that they have organizational and techn technological me measures to ensure that they protect information while they work. And what this simply means is this, where you are in breach of any of these regulations, there are sanctions and fines that follow. Therefore, it's impossible for any organization to not consider the legal business and uh, institutional necessity for having a robust cyber infrastructure having a good visibility of what their cyber infrastructure looks like and being able to sell this to the business to ensure that it remains in the top, uh, the front agenda 
of the board of directors. Obviously, also, I would quickly say the visibility, which I mentioned earlier, is the visibility of uh, the cyber landscape of the organization. Most problems we have engaged in my experience and in my practice over the years, what I've noticed is this the uh, information technology people and security people within organizations don't on themselves, in themselves, have a good understanding of the landscape, or sorry, of the cyber infrastructure of the organization they work with. And now, when you understand, when you don't have a good picture of what something looks like, it becomes impossible for you to sell it or provide a good uh, understanding of it to those you report to within the business. And therefore it affects the way they would be able to probably give decisions and also follow up with any proposal you make or your request for budget with respect to any activity you need to do with respect to cybersecurity within the organization. And finally, on this point, I would say competition, competition, competition. Every organization, most businesses in the world now, everyone is working and trading on technology. It's impossible for you not to have a good understanding of the technology you require to be able to meet your needs per time. And also to ensure that there's continuous monitoring and um, compliance with what you should comply with to affect, to ensure that your business is not negatively impacted by the risk open to your business as a result of the fact that you, you, you do business with technology. So obviously we cannot overemphasize the need for cyber, understanding our cyber infrastructure within the organization. I'll go quickly to run. We know that then for cyber security, organizations, if you have good visibility of what you do uh, or with your technology within the business, it's important that you have policies and procedures in place. And through the policies and procedures you have in place, you are able to communicate to the business what is expected of them. Like we all know, cyber security, understanding cyber risk, analyzing it is not the sole responsibility of the InfoSec department, IT, or data protection people within the business. When it comes to cybersecurity, because it affects the entire business, it's everyone's responsibility from the board of directors to the officers of the business. So we have here key policies that organizations must have. Now, I would say clearly and quickly that these policies is not all there is. Depending on the cyber infrastructure of any organization, you would need to sit down and do a review of what your cyber infrastructure and your systems look like. Depending on what your cyber infrastructure and your systems look like, will determine what policies and procedures you need to have in place to ensure that your people have a good understanding of what they can do and what they cannot do with the systems within the organization. Access control policy is very important. We should be able to control who has access to certain information and who has access to certain platform. In no organization who have a good understanding of what their cyber infrastructure is like, would you see access to systems being given to everyone without control. It's impossible. There must be an access control policy in place that ensures how you can obtain and request access to certain um, systems and also a policy and grounds with respect to when access is denied to individuals. For example, if you have an employee who joins an organization has access to the major platforms and the, the core uh, uh, platforms and systems of the organization. There should be processes in place that show that when leavers or employees are leaving the establishment, certain processes was put in place to ensure that their access is revoked and denied immediately. So there must be policies and procedures around all of this. And that's where we say that cyber security and responsibility of the InfoSec people, something that has to do with the entire business. Everyone should understand the importance of the systems they use. The policies around them should state clearly what these things are and how the, uh, the business will go around monitoring this. We have access use policy. We have the chain management policy, which is important for business continuity and all of that. We have the information security policy that tells people what information is important and what should be done about it. Obviously the different categories of data classification, information classification, this policy provides for it. We have the information security, which also provides different kinds of uh, security with respect to information. There's a physical uh, security policy that is involved, which we are talking about your entire premises, who has access to the premises, who doesn't have access to the premises. There are several things that are considered here. There's also the, the incident response policy, where there is a breach within the system. What do we do about it? How do we go about it? Do we have regulatory reporting to do? Who is responsible? Who takes, who are the, uh, the first um, frontline people within the business? Who, who do you report to? What steps do you take? There's also the remote access policy at a time where there's so much, um, there's never been a time in history where there has been this rapid and fast growing remote work development across the world. Everyone is working remotely now. 
based on the new changes we, we find ourselves in, what the pandemic has brought our, brought our way. It's impossible for organizations to continue in business without having a remote access policy that shows who has access to uh, um, certain platforms remotely and providing secured gateway whereby employees can have access to this, uh, this the, the, uh, the organization's platforms while they work from home. There's the email communication policy. Employees should be made to understand how, how uh, uh, communication and emails should be done, what social media platforms they can work on, what access do they have and what uh, they can do on this platform. There's also the, discovery, uh, the disaster recovery policy and the business continuity policy. All these policies are key and basic policies that every organization who works using technology must have. And like I said earlier, there are a lot more policies and procedures that are relevant depending on your sphere of uh, business, the cyber infrastructure you have in place and your, uh, your, the industry you find yourself in. Now I go finally to the, uh, the most important bit of the day, which I would say is how do you as people involved in majorly the information set people within the organization, the IT people, data protection people within the organization. How do you ensure you are able to get senior management buy-in to ensure that they understand the importance of cybersecurity? They understand the risk organize, the organization faces with respect to cybersecurity and they're able to do the needful. The first and most important thing I would say here is corporate governance requirement. Best practice across the world makes it clear that the, uh, the, the responsibility for cybersecurity doesn't start from the bottom that up, it starts from the top, which means that the board and senior management, they have a requirement, they have an obligation to ensure that cybersecurity remains on the top banner. And what does this simply mean? It means every senior management meeting, every board meeting should have on its agenda cybersecurity, because that is the whole essence of ensuring that there's proper corporate governance. It means that Appropriate reports should come from several uh, departments within the business on the cybersecurity uh, threats that the business faces, the activities of the InfoSec and security people with respect to cybersecurity, and a good understanding of what the cyber landscape of the business looks like. Board members, obviously, we all know, are not really involved and uh, they don't have a, a strong desire to know the day-to-day -day activities of the IT people, the day-to-day -day activity of the information security people. But it's very important that this is communicated to them in a way that they understand because there's a direct link between the continuity of the business and its effort to respect, to respect, with respect to cybersecurity and handling the threats that the organization faces as a result of lack of um, cybersecurity. So corporate governance requirement is important. The board is involved with this, senior management is involved with this. Secondly, and I would say very importantly, is make a case for cybersecurity within the business. Make a case for cybersecurity within the business. We all know the cost, uh, the way most uh, board members and senior management people perceive cost centers and profit centers. Now, it, we, it, InfoSec and the information technology is seen largely as a cost center, but there should be a different way and a new um, view new lenses for which organizations view cybersecurity. The truth is this, let organization, let the board and the senior management understand that the profitability of the business, the continuity of the business is tied to how secure in each cyberspace the business is. You need to make a cyber case, you need to make a business case for cybersecurity. Try to tie the profit of the business to its cyber, cyber resilience. Where, a comp where a, an organization has very low cyber resilience efforts, it's impossible and almost, it's a question of time, that particular organization will not be able to try it. So it's important that you are able to make a business case for cyber security. The board and the senior management are concerned about bottom line, or if you let them know that the bottom line they are trying to secure would not be there if there's a threat to the systems of the organization. If there's a particular malware or we have uh, a DDoS attack, the, the continuity of the, of the business is questioned. So what you're trying to protect will not be available if you don't have a secure cyberspace and a secure cyber, cyber environment within the business. Thirdly, you need to present your case as a necessary business process and not a compliance effort. When we say cybersecurity should no longer be a compliance effort but the business process, we are saying the entire business, the entire processes within the business should ensure 
and include the importance of cyber security, which means all your processes should say, if we have a problem with a particular system, we would not be able to achieve our uh, uh, the business goal. And if business goals is tied to your ability to perform well and your cyber resilience, then you know that it's no longer the fact that, oh, we have certain regulations that we need to comply with. It's now looking at it from the point of view, if we do not ensure that we have a secure cyber environment within this business, within the organization, we will not be in business. So it's not really about compliance. The focus is about ensuring that we remain a going concern. And to remain a going concern, cyber security should be embedded in your business process. Fourthly, I would say, create and sell a plan of managing identified risk to the business. Now, if you're trying to tell the board of uh, directors, you're trying to tell senior management how important cyber security is, you're trying to get them to create a budget for you, you're trying to get them to invest more in infrastructure, technology, and all of that. You must be able to provide them with a plan. The plan should include on the fact that you have prov provided a memo to them saying, this is what possible threat we are open to as a business, uh, as an organization doing business in financial services. If we are open to these threats, this is what we need to do to ensure that we are able to cover these threats per threat time. People need to see a plan in front of them. Now, if you tell me I have a problem and you cannot tell me how to go about solving my problem, it's difficult for me to see you as important in any way to what you're trying to tell me or to even get me to provide the resources you want me to provide. So it's important we are able to sell a proper plan identifying the risk to the business and providing solutions and steps that can be taken to cover this risk. Also, links link cyber risk to business continuity. Link cyber risk to business continuity. If you are able to provide a good visibility report to your business, showing this is the infrastructure, this is our cyber infrastructure, this is what we look like right now. You are able to to create the gaps and provide a gap analysis within the system, showing what gaps should be plugged and what technology um, uh, creations you need within the organization to plug this. You must be able to link it to the continuity of the business. If you're telling the business, we need to have certain infrastructure in place, which we do not have. We need to have certain monitoring activities, which we do not have. We need to carry out certain patches, penetration testing within the bank, which we do not have or within the system which we do not have. And you're telling the system, if we do not do this, we would not be in business for long. Now, senior executives want to see anything that could be a threat to their, able, their ability to continue in business, anything that will be a threat to their able to continue to make profit, they will listen to you. So if you're not able to link cyber risks to cyber continuity, it becomes difficult for you to do this. Okay, I'll quick, go quickly to uh, say that also, we should emphasize the, part, the point that cyber security is not the sole responsibility of infosec uh, specialists or network specialists within the organization. Cyber security is everyone's responsibility to keep an organization going and to keep the business afloat and to continue as a going concern. It's important that we're able to sell this message and propagate, propagate this message to the business. Thank you very much. Uh, very, very much. Uh, I, it was so good that I, I, I was compelled not to stop you within the 15 minutes uh, yeah. time frame during which you were you should have rounded up. But very, very, very uh, beautiful presentation. I think uh, we would all want to have a piece of uh, the presentation. I think we're going to share it after this session. But very incisive on uh, the nature and quality of what. Uh, needs to be protected uh, and who needs to know and how should we ensure that they're onboarded and of course the basis uh, for that onboarding which sits at the roots of again I keep saying business continuity and uh, the, the soul of the business itself and how the conflict between cost and uh, overall business impact has to be managed and the processes for managing those. Uh, I'm sure uh, the participants have a lot of questions, uh, but I will let Mr. Shaolu also talk through uh, his views on this uh, very important topic, uh, you know, given where the world is today, the new normal. Um, and then after that, we can take questions from everybody else. And now we can also uh, try to tailor the conversations to the specifics of, of this uh, session. But I think you, you did justice to that, and, and thank you very much. Mr. Shaolu, yeah. 
thank you so much. That was a very um, wonderful presentation. Thank I you. will try not to plagiarize you, although I'm highly tempted because it just covers the ground. Um, what I will just do in the next 15 minutes is to um, highlight a couple of things to add more flesh to what you have already done. Um, I like your definition of cyber risk. It's sufficient. What I'll just say is um, what determines or what, what, what influences the organization's response to a cyber risk or a cyber threat would, would, would um, be dependent on the type of organization and their objectives. That would also determine the focus of the cyber security analyst for that organization. Um, so what would be um, a risk or a threat to an, a health organization, for instance, may necessarily not be a threat to a fintech organization because they have different objectives. So for, for us trying to reach out to our executives and our, 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 our bosses, we have to consider first what the objective of the organization would be. And then to, so that will help us to say to them exactly what they need to care. Um, another thing I want to say is, um, I want to talk about the motivation for cyber threats or for cyber risk as it were. There are different reasons people attack us. And just like we were saying, moderator, we are, we are in the age where every, everything is going online because of the coronavirus and the, the pandemic. We, 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 we're moving everything online. I like this illustration that I've used before. Um, if we are in a house that has only one door and one access in and out, it's easier for us to eliminate security risk because all we have to do is to fortify this single access and focus our attention on this access. But if the house has multiple accesses, windows, back door, um, um, underground um, um, access, multiple doors, then we're going to have to focus our attention on multiple point entry points to prevent security risks. That's the same thing that we're facing right now. Everything is moving online, so we are, we are exposing ourselves to multiple access to cyber threats. That means that we have to also expand the frontiers of our cyber security infrastructure. So the motivation for cyber threats to, to an organization could be for economic, could be economic sabotage, could be attack coming from the competition, and it could also be for, for pecuniary reasons or for monetary gains. And we also have to understand that cyber threats to organizations don't necessarily come from outsiders, they also come from insiders. So we have to um, come up with policies and um, plans that would take care of all these um, eventualities. For instance, um, denial, denial of service attack could be an insider, it could be an aggrieved um, ex-employee, and it could also be from, from, an, from, from the competitor who wants to take us out of business. Um, I, I don't know if we know how that works. Um, where, where, where denial of service attack happens, the system, the infrastructure, the cyber infrastructure of the organization is bombarded with um, with numerous requests that the system is overwhelmed and then it shuts down. When the system is overwhelmed and it shuts down, it affects the availability of information or data. It affects the integrity of data as well. And it also affects the business continuity because at that particular is just think about it. You're trying to access your um, Zenith, bank, Zenith Bank online banking, for instance, and you see a message that says, uh, sorry, this Zenith Bank website has been hacked. I'm not going to bank with Zenith Bank after that because I'm not going to say, then my information, my money is not secured. So as an organization, we have to, we, these are things that we, we try to prevent. Virus and malicious codes are also parts of cyber threats that can affect, you know, business continuity and affect uh, um, affect our productivity as well. Ransomware, for instance, ransomware is becoming very popular. Um, ransomware is where a malicious person sends a virus, takes over your system, encrypts your, your information, and tells you to pay money for him to release the decryption or the encryption key. So they can access your information. Where you don't pay money, it tells you it's going to delete your information or it's going to send it to your competitor. So it's, it's actively holding you to a ransom. Um, 
people, malicious persons are making a lot of money from ransomware all over the world. And the incidences of ransomware have increased tremendously since the beginning of the pandemic. There's also the business email compromise, that's BEC, which should be of concern to organizations as well. Um, I'm sure we all know Osh Poppy, we know OB, Victor Sobi. That is their stock in trade. From BEC, Victor Sobi alone was able to defraud people of over $11 million. Osh Poppy, on the other hand, was going for towards around $142 million. Pounds. It was going to defraud a Premier League club of $100 million pounds from BEC alone. BEC is huge and it requires lots of them. It's like a web of other. Cyber security, cyber threats, um, money laundry, hacking. You know, let, let me just explain briefly brief how it works. So, the hacker or the malicious person sends a, an email to all the employees of an organization. One of them carelessly opens the email and clicks on the link that's inside the email that says something like, Click here for whatever reason. As you click on the link, automatically a, a software or a malware, that's better what to use, a malicious software as a malware is installed on your computer. The malware then takes control of your contacts and then reads all the email addresses of other employees in the organization, in the organization as well as reads, continues to read your conversation. Whenever there's, there's a time, or when, when you get to a time where there's supposed to be like a money transaction, this malicious person can see that you're expecting money or you're about to pay money. He can send a spurious email address, sorry, a spurious email, sorry, from his first email address or even on your behalf to the person that's supposed to pay you money and give them the wrong account information. The other person, believing that the email came from you, sends the money to the wrong account information. It doesn't matter how much it is, the money is going to go because the account information they are providing, even though it is the wrong one, it's a valid one. And as soon as the money goes to that, to that account, they transfer it using money laundry skills and move it around the world. So BEC is a very serious threat to organizations. Um, there are also other threats, maybe not necessarily um, um, of major concern to um, corporate organizations, like cyber fraud and so on and so forth. But there are steps that we can take to avert you know, these types of threats, depending on the kind of threat itself. So if it's for if it's to prevent um, ransomware, we, we need to have um, a very good um, antivirus software. If it's to prevent BEC, that's, that's, that requires a lot of training and a lot of discipline on the, on the part of the staff as well. Um, so steps to avert will depend on the type of threat, but most importantly, and which the um, previous speaker already hammered on, is the internal policies of the organization. The internal policies would tell the staff what to do at what particular time. Um, I'm not going to say so, I don't have to say what she said. For remediation, which, you know, when she was discussing internal policies, she said um, incident response, or that's, well, who we'll say remediation. There is a provision of the law in Nigeria, Nigerian Cyber Crime Act, that says, Section 21, I think, that if you think your system has been compromised, you must inform the National Computer Emergency Response Team immediately. So that's one thing that we should, we should put in, in mind. On that's on the policy um, basis. Then we talked about um, GDPR and NGPR and all the other stuff. We have to take them very seriously. Other policies may also include counter attack policies, destroy policies. So um, I've advised organizations where their policy, because of the sensitivity of the information that they, they keep, as soon as there's a breach, they destroy the entire system. Yeah. I mean, of course, it's a backup, but they destroy the entire system that has been compromised. So one, prevent further compromise, and two, to ensure that whatever information that is in the hands of the malicious person becomes useless. Um, one thing we have to understand is that intrusion, a cyber intrusion is not a one-time um, activity. If your system is compromised the first time, there is a 60% chance that they're gonna compromise the system again within a very short period of time. So cybersecurity, we have to be up and alert every single time to continue to identify and prevent cyber threats. Um, so other under regulatory compliance, 
to ask you again, to ask what you said. Um, I, IT specialists, cybersecurity specialists and organizations should have and update their ISO compliances as well, because the, this also affects business. You know, she made a very valid point. We have to be able to convince our executives that cybersecurity or cyber risk assessment is not um, a is not an expenditure. It's part of what brings money on board. So if your system or your cyber infrastructure is ISO compliant, that gives confidence to your customers and your clients to do business with you. If you are not ISO compliant, they would need to go elsewhere. You know, and then just to round up. I would just say that you know, if you're going to advise um, executives, one, you have to hire a risk assessment professional. Um, I also advise uh, that you should uh, get insurance or get money back guarantee cyber security solutions. I should also update your internal policies to accommodate all this all this concerns and challenges. Sorry, I do not have um, a fancy slide to share, but I'm sure that the slides are already shared by the first speaker. Um, Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Shaolo. I think you uh, definitely brought a lot of uh, additional insight into this, uh, particularly on the need for organization to be uh, very deliberate on the need to protect uh, their data, uh, not necessarily just as a function of good business, but also because there are legal and regulatory requirements uh, that sort of mandates that uh, you must have a degree of protection and uh, to, to, to be able to assure that degree of protection, you need to have certain processes uh, that are now uh, required uh, to protect the data of both your customers and uh, your internal customers, your employees uh, and staff. I think you also brought uh, one other important thing I think you brought into the conversation is the need for businesses to be adaptive uh, in terms of how they uh, view cybersecurity uh, as business measures, uh, since it's not a one, one size fit all, but the nature of the business would determine the uh, degree of cybersecurity uh, processes, procedures, technology, and people that you're deploying for those functions within those businesses. Uh, thank you. I think we've had very robust uh, conversation from uh, both presenters. Uh, one, well, I, I don't think, I, I think that question has been addressed because I was going to ask uh, the, the, in terms of what the purpose of this webinar should be, I think listeners or participants are quite onboarded, I believe, uh, as to why it is necessary. It's business requirement. A competitive requirement, legislative or regulatory requirement, uh, and of course compliance requirements as well, just in terms of good governance as you run businesses. Um, I, I think that is clear. Um, I also think that based on the contributions from uh, the panelists, uh, it is clear to all of us that for businesses, um, communicating cybersecurity rules uh, or processes uh, actually sits uh, within the the management uh, as a management function, we dedicated. Most companies have chief information uh, security officers, and some companies just have basic IT leads that are in charge of network security and are making sure that there's compliance. Uh, in collaboration with the human resources or personnel units of these businesses, to make sure that uh, everyone gets to be onboarded on the process and the processes are set up and the procedures. Uh, I think uh, the presenters also uh, pretty much onboarded us on the need for um, everyone to see this as not just the role or responsibilities of the people who manages the system, but as collective responsibility within the business to ensure that the business is protected uh, from cyber attack uh, and digital infractions by people who are looking to capitalize on loopholes uh, to gain advantages or, I mean, certain advantages, be it personal, be it corporate, against those organizations. Uh, I think one thing, though, that we may need to talk about, and I'm, I'm going to ask you about this, Mrs. Uh, Adewumi, 
the, the uh, sometimes there are competing uh, interests within the business. Uh, you know, not necessarily just the, the cost to benefit conflict, but also the need to adhere to certain uh, legal uh, frameworks, uh, institutional legal frameworks, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the need to protect uh, the company's data. Uh, you know, with all of these data protection rules coming on board, uh, and the limits to which the businesses need to go, or the level, not limits, not the level, because it's, I believe there are no limits to those levels, but there are limitations by the law, at the level that businesses need to go to ensure protection of its objective. There's this conflict that I've always, uh, as a professional, worried about. What are your views on this uh, in general, if you understand uh, what, what, what I'm talking about? You, okay, really, yes, you have, you have all the laws. You must work within certain uh, boundaries, but again, in order to protect your business, you may need to get outside of those boundaries. How, how do you manage that? Okay, now, I would say, largely, if I understand your question pro properly, what you're trying to say is this. Where you have regulations that you need to comply with, yeah, and um, you have business requirements that you also need to meet, in quotes. So where you have a clash between your business goals and what your obligations by law is, where do you pitch your tent? Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. I mean, think about it, the GDPR and access to certain personal data. And of course, again, you have people uh, in the cost of uh, their employment, or in the cost of their business transactions, or as customers, as internal employees, going outside of the, the remits of their access. And now you need to make sure that you provide certain uh, you know, cyber security that enables you to be able to get into their personal data, but not necessarily within the ambience of the law. But this you need to do just to protect the business. How, how do you manage that? Well, I would say one thing, what I've always done in my experience and which I still do is this. First thing, I like the business to understand we have boundaries. Where the law gives us certain boundaries to work within, we must work within those boundaries. Going mm -hmm. outside of those boundaries would definitely lead us down the road to breach. And we don't want breach. With breach comes sanctions and fines and bad reputation, like we have mentioned earlier. Now, interestingly, the law also allows you to actually play within certain areas. With respect to protecting the rights of individuals, there is no compromise with the law. Now, with respect to certain technologies to actually have in place within the business to protect individuals, the law allows you to make your own decisions with respect to, like we said earlier, an organization in the health sector necessarily does not need to have the same infrastructure with respect compared to an organization in financial services. Mm -hmm. An organization who actually maybe a small scale business owner who just gets minimal uh, data from individuals would need a different kind of technology infrastructure in place to process the activities. So the question is this, you must ensure that from time to time, you consider your business, you consider the information you owe about people and determine and decide what infrastructure you need to ensure that you protect sufficient, but you provide sufficient protection for them. Why the law allows you to think out with your decision on that place? The law does not allow you to vary the level of protection you give individuals. So if you decide to go by a level of security that would not adequately protect individuals, should that be a, a breach, you will face the music. Okay. So the question always is this, when you are thinking of what you should put in place and what you should implement within the organization or within the business. Think of the level of information you are collecting, the level of processing you are engaging in, and the level of um, protection you need to give those people's inf information. Now, if you're collecting financial details from people, you cannot compare yourself to an organization who only con con collects contact details. You get what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. If there is a breach with contact information, the level of um, such individuals can experience, you can compare it to if they have financial information included. So that's the key yeah. thing. While the law allows you to determine what infrastructure to have in place, the law does not allow you to determine whether you should protect people or not. So you need to think at all times. The level of infrastructure I have in place, will it protect the people and the information I'm getting about them? If it does, that's fine. Because if there's a breach, you would face the music. So basically, it's comparing the structure you have in place with the obligations you have respect to protecting individuals. 
Thank, th thank you very much. Very, very, very incisive. I thought it was a trick question, uh, but you did, you did justice to it. Um, uh, last one from me, uh, David, if I can call you that. Um, just, no, no, just, no, no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thinking through it, um, you know, we, we seem to assume that ev everyone would understand when we say these are the threats um, to a business, uh, within the business. Uh, you know, I, I, professionally, I used to be a non-conformist, which is why I never actually practiced law. Uh, that's my, my law background. And I, I see a lot of people like that in businesses where if you tell them that this would happen because that, uh, they take a, a very hostile approach to it. Uh, because they, they, they just they see some of these gaps you know how many times you have to change your password um, every other time you log off how, how do you um, what do you think is the best approach to onboarding everyone so the naysayers can see the benefits um, to having cyber security processes and procedures within a business and, and this is just a general uh, you know, you know, approach. I mean, you know, sometimes you have to approve ten things on your computer, and you have ten passwords for it. As executives, you just, you just get into the whole. You know, this is just not working. Uh, but again, like you said, these are necessities. How do you buy? How do you get the buy-in of all of the collaborators you need in the business in terms of communication? How do you effectively do this? So I, I just ask you what your alternative. Is. You don't want to have 10 passwords. Fine. You want to be vulnerable? You call me when you're attacked, then I'll bill you. Simple. You either go to the pain of protecting yourself, or you expose yourself, and then we'll do remediation when you're attacked. On the other hand, though, there are um, software, there are tools that can help you, you know, um, go through or go around some of these limitations and problems. So. If the problem is to remember is remembering the passwords or having multiple passwords, there are password managers that can handle that for you. You also have to choose your password managers because number one thing with cybersecurity is trust. The less people you trust, the more secure you are. Yeah. So if you have to trust more people, you know that you're also increasing your vulnerabilities. So if you trust Amazon, fine. If you trust Google, fine. Do I trust them? I don't know. So it's not always what I think. I would rather just trust myself, right? So I'll try to remember my password and not have any password manager handling for me. But if I know it's a problem, then I can, you know, give a certain level of trust to um, proprietary interest for a fee. And I know that I get um, this, this concerns taken care of. So what I, what I would just say is one of the things I mentioned earlier. If you are going to um, increase your vulnerability level by trusting more people to handle certain cybersecurity issues for you, then you should be insured. You should um, go for money back guarantees, you should go for insurance, so that if you get bumped, then you can get a fallback. Basically, that's, those are like the three things I would advise um, people. But basically, I, I'm just going to ask you, if you want to expose yourself by not being secured, then you should be ready to, like Madame said earlier, here's the music. Thank you, thank you so much. I think uh, at this point I will, I don't know if anyone in the audience uh, has any question. They can either type it in, I've, I've not said any question in the chat. Uh, so we'll just probably take a one minute to see if anyone has any question before I round this up. But this has been really, really uh, uh, very educated and um, very incisive in terms of depth of the issues and discourse. Are there questions from anyone? I don't see any. In, in the absence of any follow question, I'll ask uh, both panelists one last shot uh to two minutes just to round up uh, and you know so we, we've talked talked a lot about security 
uh, what needs to be done. Um, maybe we should talk a little bit about the consequences of insecurity. How do you deal with that? Um, I mean, cyber insecurity. So just in case there's a breach, uh, what, how do you think businesses should manage it? I mean, this is probably a disaster or crisis management um, you know, um, approach, but what, what are your thoughts in two minutes before we're on the sub? Is that the one you want to go first? Okay. Okay, I would say uh, the first thing is this, well, before you have uh, a breach and before there's a crisis, I want to believe that definitely you have a compendium of relevant laws applicable to you. Because when there's a breach now, it's not <laughs> outside of your, the remit of your organization. You probably need, you have some reporting obligations to carry out. I know that for a good one in the Nigerian data, uh, data protection regulation, I'm not so clear on it, but I can stay quickly for the GDPR now in the UK and applicable in EU. If your organization has a breach, the first thing you should do is consider what breach has occurred what do you need to do with respect to the information? If it has to do with information of individuals, you need to report it to the to regulators if certain details are involved. If certain uh, if it's if you don't have any proper remediation within your business, involve those individuals so they can take steps to protect themselves. That is the external reporting. But well, obviously, whether there's a breach internally, the first thing you need to do is this: before that time, before the breach occurs, obviously, your incident reporting policy and procedure should be known to those who are responsible within the business. The first responders, obviously, we have a group of individuals across the business. We should take the remediation action immediately to ensure that they put an end to the immediate breach when it has to do with systems, then take remediation steps. And obviously, other procedures in your business continuity and other things comes in. But the first thing to look at is this. If it's merely internal and there's no reportable obligation, what do we do internally immediately to curtail the breach? If you have external obligation with respect to, because individual's information is involved, you report within certain um, timelines to the regulators and also contact those individuals involved. So I'll quickly say that's the first step you take, the internal step and the external step. Thank you very much. Uh, David? Yes, by all means, I'm on the question with Madame. I'm just going to add that. Um, so when you you know look at all of this, then what do you do next? What, what, what are the immediate actions to take to ensure that, you know, um, the, the damage, you, you plug the leak as it were, you, you, you stop the bleeding. Um, so it depends on the kind of risk or the kind of threat that you're, being, that, you're face, that you're facing, you know. But one thing that I know a lot of people have done is to limit your connectivity immediately. So if you're connected to any external internet, internet um, connect, connection or connectivity as it's where, you also probably just pull your plug first because more often you, you, are, you suffer the security risk because you're connected to the internet. If you're not connected to any, okay, so let me just say this way. If I have a computer, a laptop that's not connected to anything, nothing can come into it. But as soon as it connects it to something, if it's a USB stick or if it's um, a, um, a LAN cable or Ethernet or even in, in, internet or even intranet, then you expose yourself to vulnerabilities. You remember the analogy of the lady with multiple doors. So you also, one thing you want to do is, as look at the internal procedures and policies, you want to close the doors. Shut the doors against further intrusions and further harm. Because as I said earlier, if you will compromise once, you will compromise again. So what you want to do is you want to shut the doors. You want to ensure that you limit your exposure and then you can take care of the problem internally. Um, but this, most importantly, you have, to, you have to spend a lot of money on security, you have to spend a lot of money on alternatives. So when I was doing my, my, um, one of my programs, I we were working on a project called Where is the Party? Um, that project was to prevent denial of service attacks by encouraging people to mirror their information, their data, to have multiple um, uh, multiple sources or multiple servers handling the same information. So if someone attacks a server, the alternative server picks it immediately. That was what we called it at the time, but now it's sounding like blockchain. So I'm just going to say that there's technology to ensure that these um, attacks don't actually affect you so badly. One of those technologies is blockchain technology. If you understand how blockchain works, you understand that you can avert um, or you can 
minimize the effects of cybersecurity risk on your business if you can employ um, if you can employ yeah, the blockchain technology. Basically. All right, uh, thank you, and I yeah, I do understand. Uh, I think I spent some time selling uh, network security services at some point in my career. But um, thank you. Uh, everyone for your the panelists the participant uh esq or practical learning this has been quite uh very uh useful and purpose fit uh webinar session uh where i'm happy to be part of it for meeting uh and uh in the absence of any other question um good afternoon everyone thank you thanks so much for having me Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, okay. Hey. Okay, good. Okay, I want to say a very big thank you to everyone who has been part of today's session. I want to say thank you to our chair and moderator, Mr. Ladeko. Thank you, Mrs. Adi. Thank you, Mr. Shalbi. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to prepare for this event and to also be here at this time. We are very grateful and we cannot take it for granted. We also want to say a very big thank you to our sponsors. They're the ones who have made today's webinar and all our webinar series possible. They're the reasons why we can um, organize this webinar free of charge. Uh, G. Elias and Co. and Advocate Law Practice. Thank you so much. Thank you to all our attendees thank you for being part of today's webinar series. And like I mentioned earlier, that we have this webinar three times every week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Our next webinar series is titled Workplace Health and Safety Issues and Legal Considerations. It's coming up on Friday, the 5th of February, 2021, at 11 a.m. It promises to be very insightful, and we look forward to engaging everyone there. Also, uh, like I said, our training for on power, registration is ongoing in respect of that. It's titled The Dynamics of Power Contract. Regulation, contract negotiation, documentation, project financing, and on everything that has to do with power contracts. It commences on the 16th of February 2021. And if you want to get more information about it, please send me a mail at chilanke at esq law.com. O.chilanke at esq law.com. You can send me a mail and we'll be ready. We'll be happy to provide more information to you um that so thank you so much once again thank you Alice. thank you activities it's been really a wonderful day very insightful very rich you know uh, content that we had today so thank you all and enjoy the rest of the day yeah thank you thank you yeah bye mr david bye bye, yeah, bye mr david thank you so much for that.